Well, thank you for joining us for this next lecture in the series on Abraham Lincoln. We're so pleased that you have enjoyed so many of these, and uh, we're going to be wrapping up here. We have only two more talks. I can't believe it. Uh, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce my colleague at the Hauenstein Center for Presidential Studies, Brian Flanagan. Brian received his undergraduate education at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, he is pursuing and just about to finish a master's degree at Grand Valley State University in Public Administration. Uh, he is truly my right-hand man at the Hauenstein Center. He is uh, somebody who is capable of taking on lots of duties. And uh, he helped forge this partnership, for example, with the Michigan Council for Social Studies. And he's just all around uh, tremendously resourceful, creative guy. And because of his uh, background in history and English, he has the ability to express himself well with quality research. So it's really an honor to see Brian um, uh, actually present at this conference as well uh, with all the other Lincoln scholars. Brian, thank you very much for doing so. Thank you. You can clap and welcome him. <laughs> Sort of an interesting, interesting experience. We're used to introducing guest guest speakers, not each other, and so I don't know. I'm starting to think if we keep building each other up as we are, we're going to walk out here thinking we can take over the world or something. But thank you for a very generous introduction, Gleaves. Um, and for any of you who are just here for Gleaves' talk, he's a very tough act to follow. So he he talked a little bit actually at the beginning of his speech about contrast and leadership style, and you're about to see a bit of a contrast in speaking style. Um, but anyway. I'll just leave it at that. Two days before relinquishing the presidency in 1809, a reflective Thomas Jefferson sat down to write an old friend. Within a few days, he said, I retire to my family, my books, and my farm, and having gained the harbor myself, I shall look on my friends still buffeting the storm with anxiety indeed, but not with envy. Never did a prisoner released from his chains feel such relief as I shall on shaking off the shackles of power. The sage of Monticello is retiring to his personal pursuit of happiness outside the realm of public life. Little did he know that one month earlier and 500 miles to the west, a boy was born <coughs> in the backwoods of Kentucky who would have a thing or two to say about shaking off shackles. That boy, Abraham Lincoln, would be forever linked with Jefferson's most famous words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson would never hear the name of Abraham Lincoln, and yet he would be forever married to him in our history books, atop Mount Rushmore, and in the nation's spirit. Lincoln would hark back to Jefferson's words again and again throughout his coming political career. Let us readopt the Declaration of Independence and the practices and policy which harmonize with it. Lincoln said in 1854. Let us revere the Declaration, he said two years later. All honor to Jefferson, Lincoln said in 1859, to the man who in the concrete pressure of a struggle for national independence by a single people had the coolness, forecast, and capacity to introduce into a merely revolutionary document, document an abstract truth applicable to all men and all times and so to embalm it there that today and in all coming days it shall be a rebuke and a stumbling block to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression. Get away with words, didn't he? On his way to take the presidential oath of office in 1861, President-elect Lincoln stopped in Independence Hall in Philadelphia where the Continental Congress had adopted the, de the declaration 85 years earlier. All political sentiments I entertain, he said there, have been drawn from the sentiments which originated and were given to the world from this hall. I have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. It was that which gave promise that in due time the weights should be lifted from the shoulders of men and that all should have an equal chance. Of course, as we shall see, Lincoln returned to the Declaration again when he visited the battlefield and cemetery at Gettysburg to give new meaning to three years of blood shed between brothers. Lincoln is most often associated with two of Jefferson's self-evident truths. One, that all men are created equal, and two, that they are endowed with an unalienable right to liberty. After all, these are the clauses that Lincoln himself most referenced. 
Lincoln's House Divided and Cooper, Cooper's Union speeches, the Lincoln-Douglas debates over Kansas-Nebraska, and the moral view of slavery, the Emancipation Proclamation, and again, the Gettysburg Address, all of these further connect Lincoln in the American imagination with equality and liberty. But there's yet another element in Jefferson's declaration that permeates Lincoln's life and career but receives considerably less attention, the pursuit of happiness. Lincoln struggled in his personal life to find happiness, and he struggled in his political life to create the conditions for public happiness. His most enduring legacy, of course, is that in the fiery trial of the Civil War, he brought forth what some historians have called a second American Revolution, overthrowing the slave power and giving a whole race of people their fair claim to Jefferson's declaration and the liberty, if not yet the equality or the wherewithal, to pursue their happiness. These three pursuits, personal happiness, public happiness, and future happiness for the slave, are what I would like to talk to you about today. Lincoln was born into a tough world 200 years ago. Growing up in the woods of Kentucky, Illinois, and Indiana, Indiana and Illinois, Lincoln's family lived the independent frontier life that Jefferson had envisioned as the lifeblood of the young nation, as the ever abundant fountain of youth. Yet for Lincoln, the West took life as quickly as it gave it. His only brother died in infancy in Kentucky. In 1818, an infectious disease spread near Abraham's home in southern Indiana. First, it had infected and killed his uncle and aunt, Thomas and Elizabeth Sparrow. Then in October, it took from him his mother, 34-year-old Nancy Lincoln. And if you were here for Gleaves' talk, you really described well what that experience would be like in a small one-room cabin where Lincoln and his whole family would have had to watch his mother die. Less than two years later, or I'm sorry, when Abraham was 17, his sister moved out of her father, his father's home, a devastating development for Lincoln, who was very much attached to his older sister. Less than two years later, she died in childbirth. And the child, Abraham's nephew, was stillborn. A neighbor later recalled Lincoln's reaction to news of his sister. He sat down in the door of the smokehouse and buried his face in his hands, the neighbor remembered. The tears slowly trickled from between his bony fingers and his gaunt frame shook with sobs. If deaths of the three most important women in his childhood caused, or three of the most important women in his childhood caused Lincoln considerable grief, he gained little comfort from his father and the other men in his life. Thomas Lincoln, who was barely literate, never understood his son's literary bent. Lincoln would often wander away from his chores to read a book under a shade tree. He would get up early in the morning, read, steal away throughout the day to read, and read well into the evening by the fireside. To his father, stepbrother, and cousins who expected to live and die laboring on a farm, this seemed beyond indulgent. It was wasteful, lazy, contemptible. His father, not generally harsh or abusive, would often beat his son for this behavior. Lincoln was lazy, a very lazy man, his cousin concluded. Navy neighbors agreed. He was awful lazy. He was no hand to pitch in and killing snakes. Lincoln, for his part, rejected their way of life and their worldview. Such a distance came between Abraham and his father that years later, despite pleas from his father's bedside where he lay dying, Lincoln elected not to return home. He stayed away, too, during his father's funeral. If Lincoln's childhood and adolescence were trying, his terrible love life brought little relief. First, there was Anne Rutledge. As Gleaves, as Gleaves mentioned, it's debated among historians today, as it was among his contemporaries, whether or not Abraham and Anne were engaged to marry after Lincoln left his father's home and established himself independently. <clears throat> but many believe that Anne, <clears throat> excuse me, not a good place to set this water up here, but many believe that Anne was the love of Abraham's life, 